Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Dr. Ken Berry, a family physician, and today I have the great honor of speaking to a doctor and a gentleman from the UK who is literally changing the way medicine is practiced in the United Kingdom. He has a practice there, a GP practice, and on the daily basis, he is reversing type 2 diabetes. And he has had very much the same experience I've had with reversing type 2 diabetes with my patients. And we're going to talk about the simple steps, the ease with which you can reverse type 2 diabetes when you know the key principles behind doing such a thing. You don't need medications to reverse it. You only need a proper human diet. So without further ado, Dr. David Unwin, welcome, doctor. Well, thank you so much for that very kind introduction, and it's lovely to be included. And I'm really interested to meet meet you and find out what you do. Yes, and so uh, I'm, I met Dr. Owen briefly at Low Carb Denver a few years back, but he met about a thousand people that day, so he may not remember <laughs> that, which is fine. But we are going to be uh, able to be in person again. Later in the year, we're both speaking to a conference of, of physicians in Poland, and we'll both be there for that. And so we're going to have some time to hang out. Uh, doctor, before we get started, I want to just tell everybody watching this, today we're live in, front, in, in our private community, which is thousands of people who have basically taken charge of their own health. And they feel so fervent and so motivated about it that they've joined our private community. So we won't be getting riffraff questions from YouTube today. We'll be getting questions only from motivated individuals who are 100% focused on improving their health and reversing type 2 diabetes. So if you don't mind, I'll be asking questions as they come along during our chat. Sure. You're welcome. Beautiful. Now, uh, please tell everyone a little about you. You're quite famous in the low carb and the ketogenic community, but there may be new people watching this video who don't know who you are and what you've done. Please give us a brief introduction. Right. So um, until 10 years ago, until 2012, I saw diabetes as a chronic deteriorating condition. And like so many doctors, I didn't really believe the patients could make much difference and I medicated, medicated, medicated. And then uh, one very assertive patient came in and put me right. And um, she said that she wondered if I was qualified because I'd been medicating her for 10 years and I never once mentioned that starchy carbs were sugar and that she'd gone low carb, put her diabetes into remission, come off her medication. And she was angry with me that I'd never mentioned it to her. And that was that, that one person on that day in 2012 changed my life in so many ways. Uh, and then to sort of fast forward, I learned a lot from that person. I really, online she was one of 40,000 people a bit like maybe your community of people helping each other to go low carb and what made me sad was that these people were being derided by healthcare professionals in the UK and across the world this was by 2013 and that made me so sad because here were motivated interested people being ridiculed for what they were doing and yet the results were amazing and I decided that I would help represent that community and that I would publish data and uh, try and get it into the media. And now, um, so now I'm a Royal College of General Practitioners clinical expert in diabetes. I write for the mainstream media in the UK. So I've written for the Times, the Telegraph, I think 30 or 40 articles for the Daily Mail. So I'm in the mainstream media at least once a month and, uh, the, and the television and so on. It's gone mad. Then we did, we developed a low carb e-learning module that was done by 460,000 people in the world. And they, then, then it became, we thought, well, we need to communicate more clearly. Where does sugar come from in your diet? 
because this is key to it, isn't it? It's not not just the sugar. It's those starchy carbs that surprise people. And um, I went back to the glycemic index and the glycemic load. And that's when the teaspoon of sugar equivalents uh, that you may have seen came in where I'm helping people understand the glycemic consequences of dietary choices by looking at a food and converting it into teaspoons of sugar equivalent uh, so that um, 150 grams of boiled rice is approximately equivalent to 10 teaspoons of sugar. And I'd say that single fact has gone around the world. So these, these infograms have been down, sugar infograms have been downloaded millions of times and they're now in 18 languages. So I've gone from um, the nobody from nowhere to some of the work has been translated into 18 languages. And like you, Ken, I'm jetting around. Uh, my life's transformed. I think the thing I'd really say is the joy it's brought me as a doctor. Uh, I was a miserable doctor. I was 55 years old and I was thinking every day about retirement and escape and how exhausted I was. Really, I was just depressed because medicine, the experience of being a doctor was so depressing. You know, I, probably for you, uh, Ken, you, you know, when you were young, you became a doctor hoping to make a difference. That's why we did. And then I didn't, or I didn't think I was. And I was bitterly disappointed with my experience. And I, I felt a bit of a failure. And then this case completely turns it round. And now um, I'm seeing people in every clinic, as I'm sure you do, who are properly well. And that, that's why it's so exciting. You're seeing people who um, are not really patient anymore because they, they don't really need me and they certainly don't need my medication. Uh, and, the, the, the experience of working collaboratively with intelligent people with shared goals of wellness is just wonderful medicine. And I think it's what and ought to be. So that, that's a sort of potted history for you. That's beautiful. I love that. It's very well said. And the first thing I want to unpack with what you said was everybody – pay particular attention. Maybe go back and watch what he said again. He was a regular doctor. He was registered. He was practicing medicine on a daily basis, but he had never considered the fact that you can improve, if not reverse type 2 diabetes by changing your diet. He thought it was a chronic progressive medical condition. The only option was to prescribe increasing doses of medication, add a new medication, and he had one patient Listen carefully. He had one patient that not only came to him and said, hey, I'm doing low carb, but when he saw the numbers, I suspect, is when Dr. Unwin, that's when he perked up and said, wait a minute, you're telling me that your A1C used to be this, and now it's this, and you're not doing that with medication. You're doing it by changing your diet. You don't look emaciated. You don't look like you're starving yourself. You look well-nourished. It took one patient for this doctor to completely change the way that he practices medicines with regard to type two diabetes. Because doctor, so many times we've got thousands of people in our group who have run up against a brick wall when they try to talk to their doctor about type two diabetes and about low carb or keto or carnivore. But I, I want everyone to have hope. Not only can you reverse your type two diabetes and achieve a level of health you may have thought unattainable, but you can also have an impact on your doctor because think about the power that that one patient had. When that one patient woke up, Dr. Unwin, smacked him about the head and shoulders and woke him up, N not only did they get better care, that one person, but now every single patient that he sees for the rest of his career gets state-of-the-art type 2 diabetes care, whereas before – they weren't getting that. Just like before I became aware of low carb keto and the strength and the power of that, I was, I was giving terrible 
advice to my diabetic patients. Terrible advice. And I'm still ashamed of that to this day. And then the second thing he said was every day was a, was a trudge, was a slog, waiting for retirement, counting the days. But now that he can actually do what he dreamed of doing as a young man, be a doctor and save people's lives and improve people's lives and keep them from having heart attacks and strokes, suddenly medicine is just as exciting as he dreamed it would be when he was a young boy or a young man. I mean, that's that's just that gives me goosebumps knowing the joy that you have every day when yeah. you go in to look at the lab results and you just you know what they're going to be because, you know, this yeah. patient has been following the proper human diet. Uh, I do. Well, there's two things. Go ahead. Doc. Sorry, there's two, two things that you've said. Uh, um, the first one is about the lab results. I couldn't believe them in the beginning. Day after day, these amazing results were coming in and I'd never seen anything like it. Improving liver function test, improving triglyceride and fasting lipids. And I got to a point where I, I used to hate looking at the lab tests because it was so tiring and it's kind of depressing. But then it started that the lab results were the treat at the end of the day that I look forward to because I was so excited about these results and, and the improvements I was seeing. I, I didn't, in fact, I, I thought the world will think I'm a fraud because the results were too good because compared to drugs, the, you know, you might get 5% improving movement. I'm getting... 33% or 50% improvement, which I'd never seen uh, before. Really, it's it's transformative um, and fun. And the thing you said was about um, advice. So here's the thing that I think possibly I'm not the only doctor. So here I was giving out the same advice every day. And I never saw really very good results. So, you know, move more, eat less, frequent small meals, high fiber diet, all that stuff. And I blamed the patients for the fact my advice didn't work. How arrogant. And I laugh now, but the common denominator was my poor advice. And the fact that I blamed the patients was shocking because actually I was at fault. And I, I'm able now to laugh with some of my patients. You know, I remember about eggs. I was saying, oh, you mustn't have more than two eggs a week and all of that stuff. Um, and it was my advice. And now um, I look back and the best I can do is laugh at myself, really. Um, so yeah. sorry, I interrupted. No, no, absolutely. I, I feel the same way. And for, for uh, the first few years after I discovered low carb keto, I had a significant amount of guilt that I had to deal yes. with. And that indeed, that's why I started this YouTube channel. And that's why I Me do too. what I do today as, yeah. a, as a means of penance to try to make up for my past transgressions of giving just terrible, dangerous nutrition advice to diabetics in the past. Now, we've got a question from Neil. Uh, Neil says, can you break down the difference between glycemic index and glycemic load and which one to focus on for daily dietary decisions? Yes, that's a very intelligent question. Uh, this is uh, what used to cause a lot of confusion. So different carbohydrates vary in how sugary they are according to the glycemic index which compares each carbohydrate against pure glucose. So pure glucose on the glycemic index is 100, and various other um, carbohydrates are ranked beneath pure glucose. But there is another factor, and that is, so not only do foods vary in terms of how sugary the carbohydrate is, but they vary in terms of the density of that carbohydrate. So watermelon, the carbohydrate in watermelon uh, is, is very sugary, but the amount of carbohydrate in watermelon isn't great because there's a lot of water. 
And so the glycemic load is a more sophisticated measure because it factors in both the glycemic index of that carbohydrate and the density of carbohydrate in that food. So that, for instance, if you were comparing watermelon and let's say cornflakes or wheat flour, cornflakes and wheat flour are in nearly 100% carbohydrate and so the effective glycemic load of those foods is much worse. And the glycemic load is looking at um, an approximation of the glucose load generated by a specific portion of food. So my teaspoon of sugar equivalents are based on the glycemic load. So we're comparing the glycemic load of, say, 150 grams of boiled rice with the glycemic load of a four gram teaspoon of table sugar. And it gives you at least an idea of the likely consequences of consuming that amount of food in terms of your blood sugar. So I hope that helps. I know it's complex and that's why I had to do the, the uh, sugar infographics because I found colleagues were confused. Very few doctors know the difference between the glycemic index and the glycemic load. Very few. Yes, I totally agree. And that's been my experiment, experience here in the United States as well. Uh, many doctors here, and I'm sure there as well, are convinced that a plant-based diet is the healthiest diet for a type 2 diabetic. And when they say plant-based, they mean lots of whole grains. They mean lots of fruit juices, lots of fruit juice smoothies. And one thing that I find that many doctors and dietitians either don't know or may have forgotten is that starch is just as bad for a type 2 diabetic as eating pure sugar out of your, remember the bowl on your grandmother's table, that the sugar bowl that you were not allowed to touch. Yeah. You might as well eat sugar out of grandmother's sugar bowl than eat starch. Can you explain to that? To explain to us I about can. starch. Yes, I can. So, um, sugar is is difficult for plants to store. Uh, the reason is it's osmotically very active. It tends to attract water. So the plants turn they concentrate sugar and turn it into something they can store starch. So starch is glucose molecules holding hands and then digestion comes along and breaks it back down often astonishing quantities of glucose. So in a way you could almost think of starch as concentrated sugar and it's the plant's way of storing sugar for energy for the next year. So that might be storing sugar in the potato or storing sugar in the rice grain or the wheat grain and it's nature's clever way of packaging glucose so that it's ready for the next year times and then you've got the sugar to go yes and there's a very popular myth or misconception here in the states i'm not sure if you have it in the uk and that is if you if you bake a potato or you cook some rice, so we know they're full of starch now, we know that starch breaks down into sugar in your mouth even before you swallow it. But there's this myth that if you put the potato or the rice in the refrigerator overnight, that this magical chemical reaction happens and it becomes resistant starch. And it's very popular here in the States and, and many of uh, the people in our community They've actually tried an experiment with this while wearing a continuous glucose monitor or using their, their finger prick glucometer. And they found that this magical resistant starch uh, skyrockets their blood sugar just as much as if they'd eaten the rice or the potato immediately after cooking. Do you have that myth in the UK? And if so, what do you have to say about that? I, I disagree with you gently, but only a little. I believe that the, there is some science behind resistant starch, but in clinical practice, like you, I find that, um, so the, the, as I understand the theory of this, is, is that the starch uh, breaks down more slowly and causes a smaller spike in sugar. 
but there are two points in clinical practice uh, I haven't found it help any of my patients and also it brings a problem because if you're chilling rice for instance as one or two forms of food poisoning can uh, so I've had one or two accidents this serious can get in there and so I I don't know whether it's a myth or not but I would say I haven't found it I haven't found it um, useful in clinic and, and yes. so I, I agree with you in that I haven't found, I haven't achieved remission of diabetes with it. Another, I also want to go back. Where did this idea that meat causes diabetes come from? Because that's weird. What, so what, what is the physiology of that? So I understand that, you know, the physiology of, of glucose putting a blood sugar I understand the physiology that is insulin. So insulin pushes sugar out of the bloodstream and inside cells where it does less damage. And your body, uh, as it, if you take in more glucose than you can run off, which many of us did, that glucose is turned into fat. And the fat building up over time in the liver causes insulin resistance so your insulin yes. doesn't work as well and the fat building up in your pancreas interferes with the beta cell function so you can't secrete insulin and that's the the twin cycle hypothesis of professor roy taylor a friend of mine now that is based on excess carbohydrate so i have never found a patient that meat not one ever that meat was the cause that when they gave up meat, their diabetes went into remission. So I remain to be put right. And we should, Ken, you and I should both have some humility because we were wrong before. We could be wrong again, but I haven't yet met that person in my clinic who meat has been, it's not meat, it's junk food. I don't, I just don't buy this thing because I don't understand the physiology behind it and the thing you don't understand you should be at least suspicious about i totally agree and i i, I agree with you the physiology uh the physiological pathway by which red meat would lead to type 2 diabetes uh, escapes me and i cannot find it in my physiology textbook nor my endocrinology textbook i think where this myth came from there was a a, a prominent vegan doctor who, uh, and you, you're exactly right, it's the fat deposition in the hepatocytes and in the beta cells yes. that, that lead to. And so what he said was, is look at all this saturated fat in these hepatocytes and in these beta cells. This is from eating too much saturated fat. And since red meat is a, is a, is a source of saturated animal fat, that's what's causing the type 2 diabetes. And uh, it was either Dr. Greger, maybe uh, Neil Bernard, is one of those guys but they've never shown a graphic showing the physiological pathway by which that happens. And I think that your theory on this is much more robust and defensible uh, than their uh, take on this. I don't, I don't think that's how it works whatsoever. Yeah. Now you brought up uh, red meat, meat, eating meat. There's a, another very popular myth here in the United States. I don't know if you have it there is that eating protein, is bad for your kidneys. And so many people, when they're like, oh, I've got to cut the carbs. So I'm, what, I've, got to, I've got to eat, right? Ultimately, we have to eat as mammals. we got to eat something. And so if I'm not going to be eating the potato and the cornflakes and the rice, I've got to replace that with something. And I like meat, so I'm going to replace it with fatty meat. A lot of people make that decision. And then when they go see their doctor, their doctor says, no, don't do that eating animal protein or eating too much protein or eating meat is bad for your kidneys. Is there, is there any scientific basis for that belief? Well, now you've, now you've really hit an interesting thing. So I've been in the habit of publishing peer reviewed papers over the years, and I've got about 20 now. And it's true to say in the early days, I did worry about the renal function of my patients because they were having a lot more protein. And the 
one of the great things about the UK is my patients are my are work with me for life. Only my death or their death will separate me. So it means I have records going back decades on thousands of patients, computerized too. So what I did, I found a professor of nephrology from Liverpool University, Professor Wong, and we audited very carefully baseline kidney function and then after about two and a half years on the low carb diet for people with type 2 diabetes. And this is a paper. If you Google Wong and Unwin um, and renal function, uh, this has been a very popular paper. Now, people with diabetes over two and a half years, because of diabetes weakening the kidneys, you would expect the renal function to deteriorate significantly for older people particularly. And in fact, you, what actually happened was exactly the opposite. So the, the expected result, even without protein, should have been a deterioration. And yet these had protein and diabetes, and the average renal function of two and a half years improved significantly. And that's published with a professor of nephrology. So it wasn't just me. Now, here's the interesting thing. The really interesting thing. So where did this come from? So I decided to swim upstream of the idea that protein is dangerous for the kidneys. And it dates back to a paper by Brenner et al. in around 1986. And the paper was behind a paywall. I think it was about $40. So I paid up. And I'm glad I did because in this paper has been cited hundreds of times as the origin of um, protein being damaging to the kidney. So th this is the start of the dogma that you and I learnt about. Well, so imagine my astonishment. I read the paper and we're learning about harbour seals and uh, rabbits and dogs and vampire bats all sorts of animals. And then it says, unfortunately, we have no human data. So am I like a rabbit or a vampire bat? So it, 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 it doesn't necessarily, animal work, although it's a useful model, really, uh, we've moved on now. And for people, uh, not one of my patients had severely damaged kidneys. They were elderly with uh, on the whole over 60 years old with diabetes and for that population um, the message was well renal function improved even though they were two and a half years older and if anybody's interested please please read the paper because pages of it and all the references uh, there but you you make an important point and it was I was relieved, but other papers have come out since mine to support that. So I'm uh, I'm not alone in that paper. Yes, and I, I will post a link to not only your sugar gra graphic, but also to that paper so that people yes. can read that. And if I can find that old paper, I will link to it as well so people can see where this myth came from. The I can brother. remember back yeah. in 2004, doctor, I had a patient come back from nephrology uh, consult and they their nephrologist has said you're eating way too much meat you've got to cut back on that this protein is bad for your kidneys and i actually did an internet search back in 2004 and even back then there were there were blog posts and articles saying where did this myth that that protein is bad for human kidneys where did that come from no one knew even then so i love it that we've tracked down where that myth yeah. originated I, and maybe I, posting I, that paper will help us to dispel it Yes, I've got another. Now, there are some most interesting. So I, I went last summer to a wonderful Keto Live conference in central Switzerland. And I was amazed because there were three professors of nephrology there who were using low carb on their nephrology patients. One is, uh, is Professor Weems, who is in uh, uh, America. And they were getting improvements in renal function uh, for polycystic kidney disease, which previously 
uh, I am not an expert in general medicine, but there are people who are, who are showing real interest in, in the keto approach for renal function. And I think over the next we're going to see quite interesting coming out from either Central Europe or North America. Ken, I think your mic is switched off. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Here, yes, now, we're here back. Yes. So thank you for that. So another thing that, that patients are very commonly told by their doctor is that if you eat that much saturated fat, your LDL cholesterol is going to go up, and that's going to increase your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. And again, we're mammals. We have to eat something. And if we put away the sugar and the starches, we have to eat something. And for many people, people love fatty meat. They love bacon. They love uh, eggs with the yolk. And so about one third of people who adopt a low carb or a ketogenic diet will notice that a few months later, their LDL cholesterol has indeed elevated. About a third of people, it stays the same. About a third of people, it goes down. But for this one third of the patients whose LDL cholesterol actually increases on a ketogenic diet, what would you say to, to them and to their doctors who are more concerned about yes. the elevated LDL than they were about the elevated A1C? Yeah. So we're talking about cardiovascular risk. And that's multifactorial. So we have to, uh, it isn't just one factor. Now, we do know that poorly controlled diabetes shortens your life by about a third. So every year that you have poorly controlled diabetes, you lose a third life expectancy. So that's a really big risk factor for vascular disease. And uh, we should factor in blood pressure. We should factor in weight, particularly waist circumference. We should factor in liver function. The original study on this was the Framingham study, a very famous study that looked at cardiovascular risk in terms of cholesterol. But they found out that liver function is a far better of cardiovascular disease than cholesterol. And then when we look at the fasting liver, uh, sorry, fasting lipid profiles, it's not just about cholesterol. We should really be very interested in triglyceride. The triglyceride HDL ratio, again, is a better predictor of outcomes, in my opinion, uh, than the LDL. So focusing in on this one thing of the LDL, you're missing perhaps three quarters of the picture. And what I'm doing with my patients is we, you need to look at the baseline data in terms of blood pressure, weight, liver function, triglyceride and HDL, at least. And then latest follow up. And for uh, published on this as well, the overall cardiovascular risk profiles are vastly better for those that go low carb. So again, if, if your listeners are, uh, are interested in BMJ nutrition, um, there's my latest paper there published this January. And there's a particular thing there on cardiovascular risk, looking at not one factor, but all of the factors that I could think of when we audited our clinic. And actually, um, it, it, it's I think probably more intelligent to look at all of the risk factors together and then decide, well, yes, your LDL went up a bit, but your triglyceride improved by a, often a third and your blood pressure's better and your waist is smaller and you feel better and so on and so forth. Am I going to worry about the LDL? Uh, now, occasionally, I'm trying to think, I haven't actually had patients where it's been much of a worry. You talk about, the, you know, the hyper-responders that you've perhaps talked about before, but they're usually, they're not my patients. So I, I haven't actually, in my clinical practice of, on the whole, people with a problem with weight, diabetes, and 
up from the waist circumference. I haven't had a hyper responder, not a single one. I know some, but they're more a different group of people who are slim and tend to be in the gym. And um, for them, I, I would have a calcium score on coronary arteries. Yeah. And in fact, my wife, Jen, Jen's cholesterol, for your interest, I think, is sky high. It's the highest I've ever seen. I think hers is 18. So it's three times the limit of normal. And her calcium score is zero like a baby. Nice. And, you know, it was five years ago. Was it six years ago? And uh, the calcium score was done again a month ago. And it's still zero after her low carb diet so i just say it's complicated and don't just look at one marker we're supposed to look at the whole of the patient not the whole in the patient as my old boss used to say yes absolutely and what i find very commonly is that doctors here in the united states only want to focus on an elevated ldl cholesterol they can completely ignore all of the risk factors that a low carb or a ketogenic diet has improved, like it's yeah. reversed their type two diabetes. It's brought their triglycerides back to normal. All of their liver markers are now normal. Their visceral adiposity is greatly improved. And so in my opinion, from looking at the research, all of those risk factors are kind of like a shotgun full of, loaded with buckshot pointed at your patient's chest versus ele elevated LDL may be a, a pellet gun or a BB gun. Yeah. And so I've asked patients this very question before. I've got a shotgun and I've got a pellet gun. I'm going to shoot you with one of those. Which one do you pick? And invariably the patients pick the pellet gun because they know that's a much lower risk factor. And I'm not even convinced that elevated LDL is actually a risk factor, but many doctors think that it is. But I, I really wish that, that doctors would listen to you more and realize a low carb diet reverses very dangerous risk factors. And it might elevate the LDL, which is maybe a small risk factor. So when you look at the totality of the patient, which we all should be doing, you know that overall you have lowered that patient's risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. Now, in your, you've been practicing medicine for a long time, doctor. Which uh, FDA approved drug or which NHS approved drug for type two diabetes have you found in your clinical experience that works as well as a low carb diet for type two diabetes? Which, which drug? None. Some things is kind of useful, but nothing. I would say the of low carb diet is where about three times more effective. Uh, I mean, the, the question is, I think, uh, if they carry on doctors, you, you have a patient who does well with low carb and then a year later they're not doing it well at that point what the doctor is i'm so sorry low carb working well isn't what's happened what has happened is the patient's on, on a low carb it, sometimes if you don't make it and told the diet has failed when you, because young food and carb is so addictive they people go back to it and what I say to my patients, if you've gone sure, is there a reason for that? And they'll say, oh, yes, doc, you know, Christmas day, I'm back in the business. And I said, well, you know, what shall we do? And they say, I suppose I'd better give up the biscuits. And I say, great. I'm to see how you're doing. So patients in the public are told you low carb diet has failed. I'm getting you now. And they are too shy to say, actually, I've drifted a bit. They're too embarrassed to say that. But the, the reason for low carb not working is that people are struggling to continue with it. For some people, it's a very difficult thing to do, particularly those who are carb addicted, which I believe completely carb addicted a terrible problem for many of my patients. As my wife, Jen, expertise. She's one of the leading people in the world on that 
that uh, so Yes, and there are many doctors out there who do not believe in the model of sugar addiction or carbohydrate addiction. They believe that that there's no way that a human could be addicted to a food substance. Uh, and I have found in my practice and in our private group that there, are, it's very common for people to be sugar, addicted to sugar to the point where they can't even make good dietary and health decisions yes. because they've got to have their sugar fix multiple times a day. Talk more yes. about sugar addiction and what you found in your practice, please. Yeah. Well, we've learned a lot from our failures. So I'm just curious about what I think go wrong striving to see if we can do better um, and a few things happened was that I was noticing similar patterns that I cigarettes alcohol so what you see health intelligent people do things that harm their health. You have to wonder whether addiction is the thing. Driver, why do they do it? And we should always ask why. why? The, the, what I saw really matched. And then, of course, I'm lucky because I'm married to a consultant psychologist, but she's also a consultant psychologist. So I've been to do um, these things came together. And as the function fits what I see. And also, when you say to patients, so you've been in your for years, you, do you think you could carb the yes, it's bread, or it's pizza, uh, or it's potatoes? And previously, until 2012 and thereabouts, and paints they were addicted. So it cut, if you never ask, you never will find it. And now every clinic thing I'm saying to people, I'm struggling, gaining weight. I'm saying, are there any killer foods that are problematic for you? And I'm surprised how often bread uh, is mentioned. People say it's not sweet stuff, it's bread or potatoes. And then I say, do you think you could be addicted to that? And people know, they know. And, and so, yes, there are doctors who disagree with that. But on the other hand, there are a great many members of the human race who have already concluded uh, that that's their problem. Because otherwise, what's the alternative? Are you a mad person? You know, that's not good for your self-esteem to see yourself as a failure. You're in. So Jen saw herself as a sort of mad person because she couldn't understand why she kept going back. And why, why could she not manage moderation? Why could she not eat one slice of bread? And, and it affected her self-esteem. And just like alcohol, moderation is impossible if you have an addictive relationship. So the abstinence is the only way to deal with cigarettes, in my opinion, and a true alcohol problem. And it's the only way for somebody like Jen to control. And I think it's a tragedy that we're neglecting a great many people who are suffering and we offer them no help other than tell them to pull yourself together. Yes, I totally agree. And and I've, I've used the example before. It's exactly like telling someone who is an alcoholic, oh, it's fine. Just try to limit your alcohol. Just have one or two yes. pints a week. And that'll be fine. Just don't overdo it. Uh, just drink alcohol in moderation. That That is the same ignorant advice that many well-meaning dietitians and doctors are giving to their diabetic patients saying, oh, just have a little dessert. Don't eat, have a lot. But if sugar addiction is real, then that is that is the most egregious of advice that you can give someone suffering with diabetes is to just have sugar in moderation. Because if they if, if sugar addiction is real, you're literally dooming that person to all the disastrous complications that come with uncontrolled type 2 diabetes. Yes. I don't know. Did you see the wonderful film called The Whale? 
the What's whale that up in, in America. I don't know if I've seen Spence the whale. Seller. It's an incredible film, and um, it's somebody with with obesity that eventually kills them, but clearly uh they it's it's a wonderful portrayal of food addiction it's, it's it's actually there is some hope in it it's not so miserable but i i went to the cinema last night and saw it and i thought what a wonderful portrayal of food addiction and how a very intelligent person in this case um a lecture can eventually eat themselves to death doing what they are doing so i believe it's a very popular film internationally so have a look I'll for the whale, Ken. I'll <laughs> definitely check that movie out. And I'm guessing yeah. that it was probably it was probably steak and minced beef and broccoli that they were addicted to. Is that what they were binging on? <laughs> Absolutely. It's so worry, isn't it? That kind of thing. Uh, no, of course not. It was the same as your patients that you see him with pizzas, ordering several and eating whole and that can junk junk food. Ultra sure. processed food, which I think is the, you know, in the States, your life expectancy is dropping now. And I'm astonished by why aren't people screaming in the streets? So you're probably the wealthiest country in the world, one of the wealthiest countries, and you're pouring, oh, you're pouring money. You spend more than anybody, and you're utterly silent about your life expectancy is dropping how old? yeah how you would old? think that uh, you would think that that would be sh shouted from the rafters but it seems like that the the mainstream media here in the united states who i might add gets the majority of their advertising dollars from big food corporations and big pharma corporations they don't seem to be interested in talking about the the lowering of u.s life expectancy at all they don't seem interested in that i think that's a that's the difference here. So we get a lot of coverage, and I get a lot of coverage in the national newspapers and the television. And I hear from my American friends that you would struggle there to get that same exposure. I think you're right. Uh, and uh, I sometimes worry we're sort of coming to the end game of capitalism because. It's doing some, you know, it's all the same, isn't it? The drug companies, the ad, the junk food advertised to children. And uh, at times it's difficult to be cheerful about this. And it, it's now you have to be quite smart to survive. I think it's very difficult. My son said a clever thing the other day. He said, isn't it funny that in the 1970s you could be slim and not diabetic and you didn't need a specialist for your sleep? and a specialist for everything. People just were reasonably healthy, and, and that is true. And he said, now, to be healthy in the modern world is really difficult, and you have to be very smart to sort out what works for you and, and, and pursue health. And when I, I traveled to America, my heart is heavy when I see the, the, the evidently sick people. Some of them are very young heartbreaking and i'm sure america was not like that 40 years ago no you're absolutely right about that when i was in kindergarten uh when i was six years old uh that was just about 20 years ago just for your information uh there was there was one boy in my class one of my very best friends who would classify today as obese as a, as, as an obese uh child out of all the kindergarten classes, there was one child who would qualify as obese. And now I, I suspect if you went to the local kindergarten class, 30% uh, would probably classify as obese. And if you included overweight and obese, it's probably 40%. And we know that there's been no genetic drift, no genetic changes in the human DNA. So something must have changed. Because indeed, when you look back in the 70s, you have to look hard to find someone who qualifies as obese. Uh, in many cases, at the carnivals and the circuses, the, the, there would be a fat person that you could pay a, a, a quarter and go into the tin and see the, the world's biggest fat person. And in many cases, that, that guy who made a living being fat back in the 1970s, 
he wouldn't even qualify for my 600 pound life or any of the other popular television shows of today. He couldn't get on the show because he's not fat enough. It's so true. So in our practice, so I've, I've looked after the same population of about nine and a half thousand people since 1986. And as a young man in 1986, I did an audit and there were 57 people with type two diabetes in that population. Not one of them was under 55. Since then, and in fact, it was a disease, a rarish disease of old people, type 2 diabetes. In that same population now, we have 550. So we've had a nine or tenfold increase since 1986. And I say the same as you can. It cannot be genetic since 1986. It cannot be genetic change. Clearly, it's the environment acting possibly on a genetic susceptibility, but the environment is what's doing it. And my money is in the sort of junk food snacking culture of sugar with your sugar with your sugar. And indeed, in a way, our own practice now, we've got, I think it's 23% of the entire diabetic register of my practice in remission. So month on month I'm getting more I'm turning back the tide and actually we save uh, I think it's about 58,000 pounds sterling per year on the drugs for diabetes because I'm not using them as much we're the cheapest practice in this area of England but I agree with you we're told it's genetic and that is a smoke screen and I don't think it's honest really no, I totally agree. And, you know, here in the in America, the the profit uh, driven economy is set up a little differently than it is in the UK. Uh, and so your government is very interested in saving money on health care because you have universal health care. But here in the United States, the federal government is very often bought and paid for by lobbyists for big food and big pharma corporations. And therefore, they turn a blind eye to uh, how, how many really mil hundreds of millions of dollars that our Medicare and Medicaid programs could save by implementing a low carb diet like you've implemented in your practice. And you said your, your reversal rate for type two diabetes in your practice is, is 25, 30%. What did you say? Well, well, no, it's better than that. So it's, it's quite interesting, or I hope you'll think it's interesting. If you come to me in the first year of your diabetes uh, and you go low carb, 73% of those people will achieve remission, 73% in the first year. If you come to me in the first five years of your diabetes, I'm going to get about 50% remission. In the practice as a whole, taken, which is an NHS practice, and we do 10 minute appointments and we're very cash strapped, no staff, it's terrible. I'm, I've achieved 23% remission for the entire diabetic population of a section of the country. So it's I, it's not like you are at all because the, those people, as it were, are allocated to me. So that's a cross section of society. So I'm uh, just so broadly, if the ones that go low carb, 50% get remission, 50% of the entire population because some of them don't want to go low carb i'm achieving 23 percent if it's pre-diabetes interestingly if it's pre-diabetes i get 93 percent sorted and i've published on that and i think the key is not your chronological age but your metabolic age and what i think this means is there's a window of opportunity with pre-diabetes the people who just diagnose ETs, they're very likely to get remission. But we also looked at, well, what happens to people who go low carb who don't achieve remission? On the whole, they started off with worse diabetic control. So it's not a surprise that they don't drop it down to remission. But as a group, if you look at the ones who are not going to achieve remission, as a separate group from those who do, they actually get bigger 
improvements in hemoglobin A1C than the remission group because they start off with a worse one. So actually low carb is great for remission, but we mustn't forget about mitigation because hemoglobin A1C is linked to mortality. So we shouldn't just talk about remission because that means people feel failure if they don't get remission. But many of my patients improve diabetic control as well as cardiovascular risk although they haven't managed to get remission. So I'm very careful now, at the beginning, looking at the case, and I, I, I've got data which helps me predict whether this individual is going to get remission or not. So if, if they're not, I talk mitigation, and that frames their expectation. And the latest paper I did, which is BMJ Nutrition in January, uh, makes that explicit and explains what how you predict whether you're going to get remission or mitigation. Very nice. Very nice. So uh, if someone were to be listening to this video because they were just diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, what would be your just simple steps, three steps, five steps, seven steps? What would you say? Okay, hey. my friend, it's simple. Just do the yeah. following things. I bet it's similar to you, but this would be interesting. So I'm saying to somebody, you just diagnosed type 2 diabetes based on your hemoglobin A1C blood uh, result. The hemoglobin A1C is the average goodness of your blood in the last three months. And then I would say that actually sugariness of the blood, sugariness of the blood, leads to damage of your the lining of your arteries we know that the more sugary your blood is uh, the more your non-stick lining of your arteries is affected it's called the glycocalyx and it's affected by sugariness so it would seem logical to me that we need to look at the sugar from in your diet and then i'm saying to so if your average sugariness is high where did that sugar come from? Because questions are more powerful than, than saying to patients, where do you think the sugar came from? Now, some people uh, actually know, in which case I'm saying, well, if I was to support you, would you have a crack at that? Or shall we start drugs? Which would you prefer? I'm giving people a choice. Today, shall I start metformin? Or would you prefer to avoid drugs? Which would you prefer to do? Not one person has turned me down in 10 years. And then we're talking sugar. Where do you think the sugar has come from? What do you propose you could do about that? S some people know, but others are mystified. At this point, I get out the teaspoon of sugar equivalents so people can look at the foods they're eating and understand. Oh, it's chips or bananas or orange juice or uh, dried fruit or whatever. And then I have, um, once they're motivated, I'm careful not to give advice until they ask, until they want it. You've got to hook them first. You've got to hook them. And so I'm hooking them with hope and the idea they can avoid drugs and the hope of better health and the idea that I will support them. And at that point, I bring out the teaspoon of sugar equivalents. I bring out, we have a standard diet sheet which has been published in all 20 of the papers. It's been standard now for years. And I say, well, have a, have a read of this. Then think about it and maybe come back. Who does the shopping? Who does the cooking? I'd love to meet your wife or your partner, whoever it is. Do you want to come back in a few weeks and let's see how you're doing? And you may have questions. And that takes me about 10 minutes. That's, that's there. I... Anyway, that's what I do in every I clinic. Love it. I and love it, it. It's not rocket science, really, is it? <laughs> it's not not really, but I know for some people who've never thought about dietary choices their entire life, they thought that I can eat whatever. It's fine. Humans are magical. But for, for those people, it's, it's a bit of a wake-up call to go, oh, so you mean the food I eat actually matters with regards to my type two diabetes, because I think there are people out there that just don't know that. So I love that, that approach to ask them questions and let them arrive at the conclusion on their own. I think that that gives them more of an investment in the process. I love that. It does. 
a, another concept, preferred future, that, you know, each of us has different futures, different possible futures. And, and it's, so this is a psychologist, you know, she's fascinated by hope. And she says that engaging with people's preferred future, they'd prefer not to be on drugs, they prefer to lose weight, they prefer to have more energy. That's part of the hooking process. And then it starts it. The other thing it does is I think what I used to do was talk at people and tell them what to do. Whereas this is doing medicine with people in a collaborative way with some share. And I think that's sort of the magic as a clinician that it, instead of them silent and dumb, they're joining in. And I'm asking them questions and it's becoming a two way thing rather than me talking at them, which is what I used to do and wasn't very successful. Wise words from a from a, a, a very experienced clinician. Dr. David Owen, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I can't wait to see you in person in the near future. Uh, any parting thoughts that you'd like to give our listeners? Parting thoughts, let me think. I think it's all, yeah, I'm full of hope. I'm full of hope. And as part of that, I think it helps is if each of you could see yourself as an ongoing experiment. Because then you could see what works and do more of it. And if you make a mistake, don't beat yourself up about a mistake. Say Christmas or a holiday, a vacation that you've been on and that you've gained lots of weight. Instead of uh, beating yourself up or feeling guilty about it, do this. Say, well, what will I do next time that would have a different outcome? Exactly what would I do? How would I do Christmas in a more successful way? Could I go on holiday in a way that wouldn't cause me to gain a lot of weight? And I call this reframing failure because many of us see yourself as an experiment, learn from errors. I'm an old guy. I've made a lot of errors. Only bright people don't make errors twice. I try to learn from my mistakes, but certainly I've made them all my life and you will too, but that doesn't matter because you can turn it to the good and think, what would I do differently next time? But be specific, not a general thought, but exactly what would you do differently? Maybe write it down and tell somebody. That's my final word. I've enjoyed that. Ken, well done. Well done. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Unwin. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I'll see you next time. You will. Goodbye, everybody.